In the nearby community of Echo Bay lives Alex Morton, a biologist who has been working in the Broughton Archipelago for over 20 years. Three winters ago, the commercial fishermen in my area phoned on the radio to say that they had extraterrestrials stuck to the eyeballs of their fish, and I didn't know what they were talking about. So I went down there and I found these uh, arrow-toothed sole, which are also called turbot. And up to 95% of them had these uh, very unusual eye parasites that the fishermen had never seen before, I had never seen before either. So I go and sit on their boats and count how many of the fish should have these things. And uh, it was almost every single one of them. So I began to write to scientists around the world, I said, is this normal, is this normal? And uh, they said, no, this is, this is extremely high. It should, it should occur in about 1 to 2% of the fish. But in this area, it's in the high 90s. Some days it's 100% of them. So I began to look through the literature. And at first I found nothing. I went to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Um, they said, oh, it's normal. Don't worry about it. But when you look through the literature, they, you get things like this, tumors, lesions, and eye parasite in flatfish marine parasites as pollution indicators, which tells you if you're getting lots of parasites, you're in a polluted environment. I'm getting reports from fishermen in other areas saying that they're seeing this and the lesions and the tumors in other areas where there's salmon farms. You know, <laughs> the fish will only take so much. You, you, you cannot be um, subjecting them to an environment like this and say this industry has no impact. Alex first moved here 20 years ago to study the wild orca. However, the focus of her work has since shifted. She now spends much of her time trying to determine the impacts the farms are having on the whale's habitat and their main food source, the wild salmon. When you look out here, you know what? We're looking out at like five Serengeti plains stacked one on top of the other. So much life out here. You got your guys that are just off the bottom and then you got your deep water and then you got your mid water and then you got your, your surface. It's, it's beyond what, what can happen on land. In 2001, Alex noticed that the juvenile wild salmon of the Broughton were infested with loads of parasitic sea lice. While some lice are common on adult salmon, it was extremely rare for juveniles to carry high loads. Alex suspected that the young wild salmon were contracting the lethal loads of parasites from the nearby fish farms. The farms, she believed, were acting as a breeding ground for sea lice and disease. Based on her observations, she predicted there would be over a 90% decrease in the numbers of adult pinks returning to spawn in the fall of 2002. While the rest of the coast experienced good returns, millions of salmon failed to return to the Broughton Archipelago. It was one of the biggest collapses the coast had ever seen. The following year, 11 fish farms were emptied during the time when the young fish would be migrating by. The experiment seemed to work, and in 2003, the smolt samples were healthy with fewer lice. The pink salmon seemed to be making a comeback. However, come the spring of 2004, the farms remain active, with a new generation of wild salmon heading out to sea. Alex's work is attracting more attention from the scientific community. I'm a graduate student in mathematical and statistical biology at the University of Alberta. What we're doing is we're, we're looking for juvenile pink and chum salmon here. But we're out here studying this because it's of great importance to the conservation of wild salmon, to understand the disease interactions between fish farms and wild salmon. The reports from uh, Europe indicate that disease transmission from farms to wild salmon has had very negative effects on their wild salmon and studies that have been carried out in British Columbia so far indicate that the same things are happening here. So we're trying to take a really close look at what's going on. Cow, cow, coke, coke. Cow, 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 moat, coke. Hemorrhaging anal fin, hemorrhaging dorsal fin, hemorrhaging gill plate. Three copes. Coke. Cal, Coke, 57, and uh... So, 24 sea lice in total on that fish. After sampling thousands of fish, the team found that in some areas, up to 96% carried lethal loads of lice. I think the even cycle's extinct. 
because um, this is worse than I've ever seen. Next summer, the summer of 2005, I don't think there's going to be a pink salmon in the Broughton. This scenario will just play over and over and over again until finally it's realized when you have too many farm fish on the migration routes, you lose your wild stocks. And it's really silly that we're being in, you know, forced to reinvent this wheel because this has already been discovered elsewhere. I mean, if you want to farm salmon, there's ways of doing it that don't destroy the wild fish. You just have to separate the two. No cattle farmer would have his stocks right in the middle of the buffalo herd because of that different diseases that they get. It's just common sense. And so pathogens have been loosed. It's like opening Pandora's box. You start mixing animals together that used to have barriers. You overcrowd them so now the pathogens can jump and they can mutate. I mean, they are the ones that are really benefiting from this, the viruses, the bacteria, and the uh, parasites. And I think it's unwise to underestimate those little guys. <laughs> you know, they're very resourceful and they're benefiting enormously from our activities. There are few who know the waters of the Broughton Archipelago more intimately than Billy Proctor. He's lived here nearly 70 years. <laughs> As a longtime fisherman, Billy has spent many decades closely watching the cycles and patterns of salmon. I've been here all my life. You got everything you want right here. Yeah, I take people on tours like eco ecology tours up the inlet and the rivers and that. And they're just amazed at what I can show them with what's everyday life to me. When you see the fish coming back to the stream and all the critters feeding on them, it's, it's pretty neat. And it makes me feel good to be able to do that. Take them and show them just the way things are out in the, what I call the real world. Wild salmon are coming back stronger every year where there's no farms bothering them, like up on the Skeena and the Nass, they got good runs. And Columbia River, it's coming back. So it's too bad, really. I mean, why do they have farms in this area right where all the fish are migrating by? And if you read the recommendations, they're not supposed to put them on migration routes, and that's where they put them. If the wild salmon collapse on this coast, the whole ecosystem as we know it will collapse. The bears, the eagles, everything. Everything relies on salmon to come in to feed on it. And we got to take a chance of wiping that out? My God, we got one of the richest coastlines in the world here. It's just so bizarre that a bunch of bureaucrats just don't give a damn. If they've seen all that in the natural state the way I have, they might have a different outlook on life. They wouldn't put a dollar value on everything. I don't like to be a pessimist, but I can't see it turning around, really, unless enough people stand up for what they think is right. Or we'll have a desert instead of a rich coastline. I sure as hell wouldn't want to see it. I'd like to think there's something for the kids coming up. This is our last wild food source. This is the last animal that produces enough food in a wild, natural way. If the corporate experiment, the monoculture, the overcrowding, the use of pesticides and drugs, if that turns out not to work, wouldn't it be a good idea to have some food coming back to our homes every year without us? Along the wisdom man to man. 